Good morning, everyone. I'm State Senator Susan Rubio. Thank you everyone for joining us here today for such an important conversation. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on domestic violence as a public health crisis. As you all know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And during this discussion, hopefully we'll have valuable information, but more importantly, we wanna help victims with resources and strategies. Not only do we want to provide updates, what does domestic violence look like during the pandemic? But again, make sure that our victims and survivors have all the resources that they need. We are living through some very difficult times. And as you've all seen recent articles, domestic violence has only increased during this pandemic. This pandemic has made it the ideal situation for an abuser to isolate their victim and nearly impossible for victims to ask for help. People are already fearful with the pandemic and this adds an added layer. So today, before we get started, I wanted to thank the panelists here today, the moderators and everyone watching at home, but especially I wanna thank California Governor Newsom for being an ally and signing most of my bills. I also wanna thank LA County City Attorney Mike Fuhr, who was also a co, um, I'm sorry, a sponsor of one of my bills this year. Thank you so much. And we'll hear some words from them right now. Thanks everybody for the opportunity to participate in today's roundtable discussion. And in particular, let me just thank uh, Senator Rubio for your leadership in California, for that matter, around the nation on expanding protections and, and moreover resources for survivors of domestic violence. October, as we all know, is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And this year we are acutely aware of the challenges faced by survivors of violence and abuse in communities and of course, all across our state. This pandemic and the stay at home orders have only made it more challenging, more difficult for those that are experiencing abuse to get the kind of support, the quality support and timely services that they need. To victims and survivors, know that you're not alone, even in these difficult and challenging times. Your community is here to support you, and California is committed to using every tool at our disposal to advance justice and get you the resources that you deserve, the resources you need. This past summer, we, we launched a series of new initiatives to support survivors of domestic violence amid COVID-19. This included new state funding and new partnerships with the private sector. I was proud to sign a number of those bills last month to bolster protections and turn principles, our collective principles, into real action. This legislation will help empower survivors of crime and abuse to, to speak out against their abusers and access those critical resources. SB 1141 finally recognizes psychological abuse known as coercive control. AB 1927 creates an amnesty clause to encourage survivors and witnesses of sexual assault to testify in court. And SB 1276, it builds on the executive order that I signed earlier this year to relieve the financial burdens on domestic violence centers. Well, we're proud of all of these efforts to advance partnership uh, with some of the most, uh, well, most of you that are participating here today. But as we all know, this work is far from over. We must do more to end violence against women and domestic violence more broadly so that we can all live in a less violent and more just world. So thanks again for allowing me the privilege of participating in this important discussion and, and thank you moreover for all of your extraordinary leadership in this space. Take care, everybody. Domestic violence is on the rise during this pandemic. That trend should concern all of us and it should serve as a call to action. I'm proud my office, already a leader in protecting domestic violence victims, continues to rise to this challenge. We sponsored SB 1141, legislation adding coercive control to the family code definition of domestic abuse. This legislation was authored by Senator Susan Rubio, a pioneer in the domestic violence field. Coercive control is an insidious form of abuse that has not been recognized by our state laws until now. This groundbreaking legislation among the first in the nation gives domestic violence survivors the ability to testify in both family and criminal court proceedings 
about the liberty deprivations underlying coercive control, like constant monitoring of a victim's movements, isolation from family and friends, control over finances, and interference with other essential freedoms. Governor Newsom signed SB 1141 into law last month. This legislation is particularly vital in our pandemic world as abusers have taken advantage of restrictions to further isolate and control their victims. Since the start of the pandemic, my office has undertaken efforts to ensure that survivor outreach and support continue. I launched the Behind Closed Doors campaign to communicate to survivors that help was and is still available even during times of shelter in place. In collaboration with the LA District Attorney and the Mayor's Office, my office created flyers listing available legal aid, shelters, and hotlines for domestic violence survivors. We partnered with the California Grocers Association and the LA Unified School District to post these flyers throughout grocery stores and LAUSD grab and go food sites throughout LA County. Also in collaboration with LAPD and the Mayor's Office, my office developed COVID cards. These cards provide guidance on obtaining domestic violence restraining orders in family courts during the pandemic, when in-person appearances have been significantly limited. LAPD officers now distribute these cards to victims of domestic violence crimes. My office has always prioritized victim rights. I recently spearheaded the development of working groups to address gaps in victim services. I directed the groups to come up with recommendations on how to implement progressive, culturally sensitive, and trauma-informed practices. My office continues to file and prosecute crimes of domestic violence, seek protective orders, and offer victims emotional counseling, safety planning, and court support. You can learn more about Behind Closed Doors and other city attorney initiatives on the city attorney website www.lacityattorney.org. I'm honored to support the efforts of Senator Susan Rubio and others at the forefront of the work to end domestic violence, including the panelists gathered here today. Once again, I wanna thank Governor Newsom for being such an important partner in this endeavor and also LA City Attorney Mike Fuhr for being a strong advocate and ally to victims and survivors. But before I give the floor over to our moderators, Evan Rachel Wood and Esme Bianco to provide opening remarks and, and lead today's discussion, I wanna take this moment of privilege to thank both of these amazing ladies who have been instrumental in partnering with me, not only to draft legislation, but help me get it over the finish line. Thank you so much, ladies, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Rubio, for hosting this forum. Um, as you said, my name is Evan Rachel Wood, and I am a domestic violence and sexual assault survivor. Um, also uh, championed um, the Phoenix Act, which Senator Rubio brought forward. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm happy to be here and I'm so happy to see all of these incredible changes taking place um, in such a short amount of time. It's incredible what, we, we, what we've been able to accomplish. So just thank you so much, Senator Rubio, for everything. Um, okay, is, is everybody ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, oh, but also, you need to introduce oh. yourself. Hi, <laughs> I'm Esme Bianco. I'm a domestic survivor, also an advocate. Um, I worked alongside Evan um, on the Phoenix Act and also with Senator Rubio, who's been an amazing champion. Um, you know, the Phoenix Act came from the fact that Evan and I were unable to seek justice for what happened to us because of the statute limitations. So um, together we managed to change the statute limitations on domestic violence crimes in California. Um, so it's been an amazing journey and it's really exciting that we're having this discussion today because um, I think especially um, like Governor Newsom and uh, Mike Fuhr mentioned during COVID, um, this is an especially dangerous time for survivors um, and a time when survivors could very easily be forgotten. So um, I'm really glad that we're here today and we're talking about this really important subject. So... 
that being said, we are going to start up our conversation with Laura Richards, who will talk about how to cope and deal with trauma amid the pandemic and the work she's done in the fields. Hi there, my name's Laura Richards, and I want to start off just with thanking again Senator Rubio for putting on this particular event. Um, there's been incredible change across the globe, and those who are forensic linguists will hear that I'm British, um, but I am a resident of sunny California, a permanent resident, so I have a real vested interest in bringing across good practice, having been at the forefront of law change on five occasions. And law change being for victims, for survivors, always with their voices at the centre of everything that I do. And suffice to say, the majority of the work that I've been engaged in is tracking violent and abusive men and listening to victims and listening hard to women telling their stories. And I believe very strongly that it should be women telling women's stories on the big screen, as well as in our courts, as well as when we're changing law, particularly when we're talking about raising awareness about the risks and dangers of coercive control and stalking. And coercive control and stalking are such nuanced and idiosyncratic behaviours, those who've suffered from it will know that, it's very personalised. So those who don't know me already, just a quick canter through, I only have eight to 10 minutes to speak to you, but I am really delighted to have those eight to 10 minutes my work really started at New Scotland Yard. I ran the sexual offences section, and you'll see me in the picture next to New Scotland Yard as a baby criminal behavioural analyst, cutting my teeth at the sharp end in a male-dominated environment. And I went on to run the Homicide Prevention Unit, and I learned a lot about victims. I learned a lot about what we need to do to prevent and protect from law enforcement perspective, but also working in partnership. I helped set up the National Stalking Helpline. I changed the law on stalking. Um, I was fortunate enough to work in the FBI for a number of months in the behavioral analysis units at Quantico. And one of my partners there that I worked with, Jim Clementi and I, went on to use Hollywood's resources to put a spotlight on an unsolved cold case, the case of John Bonet Ramsey that you may have seen. Always my work is about getting justice for victims uh, being an advocate and speaking the truth about what's going on, what's going wrong, and what we need to change. I'm still working with Deborah Newell now, and indeed Terra Newell, and I want to bring them into uh, this particular session just to talk quickly about why it's important that we understand coercive control. And if those of you are listening, perhaps you haven't heard the podcast, Dirty John, where there's over 70 million downloads all across the world of people listening. And when I spoke with Christopher Goffard, who broke the story in the case, he said to me, when I explained coercive control, he said, I've never heard of that, Laura. And I explained what coercive control was about entrapment um, how women become entrapped, that it's insidious, that it's almost invisible to many people. And it's about domination and subordination. And there's structural in inequalities that keep uh, a woman entrapped. And he said, if I had met you before, Laura, I would have told the story differently. That's a key lesson for everybody. And that's why I've gone on. I've spent a lot of time, um, all my time now in California, helping people tell stories that are authentic and true. And I want to just start off with, there was, of course, the Bravo show, but there was also the documentary, which I co-produced. So I'd like to just share a, a small clip from the documentary. And by the way, Mr. Wright was never Mr. Wright. He was always Mr. Wrong, but he was able to appear in a very different way. So I'm just going to play, I hope, a, a very short clip. Um, and just to say that there is a trigger warning to this. Um, it is upsetting and distressing, but that's the nature of what we're talking about. So hopefully I'll be able to pull this up on screen. Newport Beach, number one. I need an ambulance right away. Someone's been stabbed. It's a girl. Do you see the blood? Yes. I felt like I caused this. This is the last thing I ever wanted to happen. I'm a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. I wrote the series Dirty John and the podcast. There are life and death stakes in this story. I bet John online 
He made me feel wonderful. It was the best feeling in the world. John was very attractive, very, very charming. Many women were terrorized. John Meehan was a serial predator. He went from victim to victim, took what he could, and found a new one. I, I knew he was trying to hurt my mom, hurt my family. I hated John. He broke me in half. I was a good person. Hi, Mom. He's going to turn on you and destroy your life. John is the most dangerous, devious individual that I ever prosecuted. We arrested him, and inside the backpack, he had a revolver, hundreds of rounds of ammo. I knew that John was capable of murder. One of the lessons of this story is that monsters don't always look like monsters. And that's very true. Monsters don't look like monsters. They're not evil. They live in our homes, eat at our table. Psychopaths don't have two heads and they're closer than what you think. And the, all these cases are always a lesson. For, for Deborah, what were the lessons? Well, four times she tried to get help. Four times she approached law enforcement and she was told it's a family matter. He hasn't hit you. There's nothing we can do. Well, the reason that he attacked her and Newell who you saw in the clip was because he couldn't get to Deborah. And in fact, Deborah did everything right. She did everything I would have advised her to. So how can that be right? How can it be right that somebody takes the advice and the secondary trauma that happens, happens through professionals and it happens through our criminal justice system. The ongoing trauma in lockdown continues. Deborah said, gave me permission to share with you that her trauma came to the surface. And I've been working with her since, the same for Terra, the same for many clients that I've been working with in lockdown, in isolation. They've had to sit with a lot of things that perhaps they haven't. So they may have felt they survived, but they're still surviving. And then you've got victims who are still locked down with perpetrators. But in the case of Deborah, where there was coercive control and separation and escalation and stalking and threats to kill, and she was terrified, she went into hiding for seven months. And he was a serial perpetrator, yet nothing was done about him. That, with my law enforcement background, is what we need to think about. With a background context to Deborah's family was that her sister was shot dead, February the 7th, 1984. Shot dead by a man who was coercively controlling her, Billy Vickers. This was glossed over in the podcast. Suffice to say, I met Deborah on February the 7th, 2017, International Women's Day. And we vowed, we raised a glass to Cindy that we would change the law in Cindy's name and all the other women who've been abused who aren't here to tell their stories. And we know domestic abuse is the number one public health problem, the leading cause of injury, the leading cause of homelessness. We know it's the leading cause of women being murdered, femicide. We know that at least one in four perpetrators are serial, i.e. they repeat but they're more, no more likely to go to prison if they harm or kill one, three or 18 women. How can that be right? Since Cindy's death, 39,420 women have been murdered by a man who's supposed to love them. That's, I calculated it at three women every day, but it's actually now four women a day, four women a day in America. And I've been tracking these cases across COVID, the women who are locked down with the abuser and these aren't COVID related murders, they're coercive control related by entitled men. The murders of women have gone up, but the murders of men have gone down when we're talking about domestic violence and the home is the most dangerous place for a woman. And I'm sorry, I'm not giving you better news. Uh, children are seriously impacted too. You will all know this, but complex trauma results if you are in a home where there's a domestic violence perpetrator. And notice I'm not saying domestic abuse home because there's a perpetrator who's committing the abuse. So we have to think about the long-term impact, the trauma. And we know many women are diagnosed from being child victims of having, having borderline personality disorders when they actually have trauma responses. So we have to understand trauma. So some quick helpful things about trauma. I would highly recommend you listen to Brene Brown's most recent podcast with doctors Amelia and Emily Nagoski, where they talk about responses to trauma. But leaving is a process, and I would recommend people leave, but leave safely. And you can't heal if there's still abuse going on. That's the challenge. 
But each of these things, breathing deeply, connectedness with a safe contact, sleeping well, nutrition, all these things are very important. Even hugging someone, you release oxytocin if it's a safe contact. And just a word on advocates and frontline workers. Right now, I'm hearing from many of my co-workers who have emotional fatigue, compassion fatigue, empathy fatigue, vicarious trauma because of dealing with the pandemic and domestic abuse being at such a high prevalent rate. So the only, I, I would love to say more, but I know my time is almost out, but I wanted to say healthy relationships and education starts with early messaging for children. Pulling your pigtails is not that he likes you. So if we teach girls the abuse, it's a very confusing thing for girls and boys if we're teaching them wrong. And girls are taught to be polite and keep quiet and be small. And boys are taught to man up, not emote, and that they're entitled to girls and women. And the fairy tales continuous theme of women and girls being rescued by men. There's a lot of unpacking that we need to do. Love bombing is a major problem, as we saw in Dirty John, and the neuroscience of it as well. The dopamine, the endorphins, the chemicals are something that we have to think about with whirlwind relationships and not blaming victims for falling in love. So coercive control, ownership and entitlement, it's not about psychological abuse or emotional abuse on its own. It's actually about entrapment and domination. It's much more, and it's a patterned behavior. With a skilled abuser, the abuse is invisible to many people, and they set rules and regulations to exact obedience, and it happens over time, and the patriarchy reinforces it. And the last minute I just want to share the Victims Voice survey, which are victims in America, 1,278 victims who've answered a survey about coercive control. 98% said that they'd experienced domestic abuse. 99% experienced controlling and domineering behaviors. 95% the violence wasn't the worst part. Many did report to the police, but the pattern wasn't taken into account. That's a big problem. Many didn't report because they said they were too scared. They didn't realize it was abuse. They didn't realize it was a crime. They thought it was normal. So again, we go back to Cindy Vickers. Why did she not know that what Billy was doing to her, following her, monitoring her, not allowing her to wear a bathing suit was control? And 99% of victims say domestic abuse law sh should be updated to reflect the reality of coercive control. And as always, I want to end with victims' voices. Two quotes here from two victims who took the survey anonymously saying the violence wasn't the worst part, it's the erosion of self and autonomy. It's your confidence that's eroded. It's the fact that you cannot heal if people don't understand and identify what you're going through and it impacts on you long-term lifetime legacy. So trauma-informed services are really key. And if we say violence against women and girls is unacceptable, why then do we accept it? If we don't see it in our legislation, if we say it's a pattern, but we have an incident-led response, if we don't understand the criminal justice system and family justice systems are designed by men for men, that's why as women, we need to raise our voices to create real change. And there are lessons from the UK in particular, having spearheaded the coercive control law reform campaign successfully in 12 months. I'd love to share those lessons with Senator Rubio, Governor Newsom, Victims at their very worst times deserve the best from all of us. We are lifelines. And if this is a pandemic, we know it is. We can actually do something about it. So isn't it time that we did? So if you want to complete uh, the petition or the survey, here's the link. We'll send it out to you. I'll end with my little puppy, Beatrice, with all my contact details. Um, she's a wonderful, wonderful resource for me, for my vicarious trauma that we all suffer when we come into contact with abusers and also listening to victims. So I just want to thank you all for the work that you're doing here. I'm really excited to be working with you all to keep victims safe and to make California the safest state in America, if not the safest place in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really important. Um, I appreciate all of that information and education. Um, it's so hard to hear, but so important. Um, up next, we have Senator Susan Rubio, uh, which 
as we said, we've had the pleasure to work with on domestic violence legislation. And she'll be going more in depth on the work that um, she has accomplished in the Capitol. So, Senator Rubio. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Laura Richards for all the important information she shared. And, uh, you know, a lot of it resonates. And so what I wanted to start off by saying is I'm also a survivor. And I think it's important for me to share that, that I also was trapped in an abusive relationship as well as as me and and, uh, and other panelists here today, because we want, at least for myself, for all the victims that are out there listening, to understand that, that we do understand your pain, we understand your trauma, we understand how difficult it is for you. And so hopefully by all of us speaking out today gives you the courage to, to come forward. And, and I know that there's a lot of shame that comes along with being a victim, but I just wanna, again, reassure you that it's not your fault and there's nothing to be ashamed of. I know it's very difficult even for myself right now to speak about my personal experience, but uh, through my journey, I've uh, met so many wonderful advocates uh, and I hope to continue to do work in this space and continue to engage all of you on this panel to, to help me push legislation forward. Um, I wanted to touch on some of the bills that we've been able to, to pass successfully. And so I wanna start with SB 273, which is the Phoenix Act. And I think that um, Evan already touched on it a little bit, which is um, extending the statute of limitations for victims. Um, a lot of us fall under that category. Um, unfortunately, people think that uh, trauma happens and it's gone one day. But the reality is that trauma happens to different people at different times and everyone deals with the trauma differently. And so this bill allowed, um, now allows victim to take a little longer to heal, to get counseling, to come forward when they're ready. And hopefully we're, we're gonna continue to push the, the gold post on this one and try to extend it a little further. Um, so I'm really proud of this. So thank you again to, uh, to Esme and, um, and for just uh, Esme and Evan for working on this legislation with me. Uh, and again, for all of you out there, please know that now, instead of three years, you have five years to come forward and hopefully you get the help you need. Uh, the other um, legislation I wanted to discuss is SB 316, which requires the National Domestic Violence Hotline to be printed on the back of ID cards from seventh grade all the way to higher education. And this one took effect this month. And I heard, thought I heard Laura uh, discuss this as well. Uh, it, you know, talks about our youth and how they handle relationships. And the reason I felt compelled to pass this bill in particular is that I was a, a teacher for 17 years. I taught elementary school. And I, you know, some people are surprised when I tell them that I saw the manipulation, the pushing, the shoving, everything that we see in adult relationships already happening within our youth as young as 10, 11 years old. And it seems innocent enough but we know that that's how domestic violence starts. It starts with a small push and then it escalates. And so my goal was that by the time our students reach middle school and high school, um, they have a number to call and not necessarily the victim, but their friends, if they see something, I hope that they do take that number and report it uh, as well as uh, adults. I know that typically we see victims as adults, but these are children and that also need our guidance and our help. So again, for children, for our students and for their parents, there's a number there that they can call. Um, there's another uh, important bill that I wanna discuss and uh, there's been a little bit of a discussion about this already, which is SB 1141. Uh, this is course of control, which Laura discussed. And I wanna thank uh, Mike Fuhrer for being a sponsor on this bill as well. Uh, I believe we tried to include this last year with the Phoenix Act and, and unfortunately we weren't successful and we had to remove that piece out of the, the bill. And uh, sometimes we think it's such a common sense bill, but uh, we did run into some resistance. So I wanna thank all the advocates who, who you know, we, we set out to educate people. We set out to, to let people know what that feels like. And uh, so very basically, I think Laura said it best. It really just, it's an erosion of yourself, self-esteem. And one of these statements that I hope we, we get rid of completely is that statement of why didn't she leave? I'm sure many of us here has, have heard this statement over and over again. It didn't happen. If it did, why didn't she leave? And this speaks exactly to coercive control. I know that we think of uh, domestic violence as an assault where a bruise is left, you have a black eye, a broken bone, but the reality 
reality is that abuse happens before the physical assault. It happens little by little, or the individual is taking little by little your liberties from not letting you see your family, not letting you see your friends. Pretty soon they're monitoring your text messages, they're taking your phone away. And I know that we don't think of this as domestic violence, but for anyone listening out there, this is abuse. No one has the authority to take anything from you, including your decision to see your, your family or see your friends. And so I wanna thank everyone for bringing this forward. Force of control, I think it's at the heart of what domestic violence is. It starts with psychological abuse, and then it leads to the point where a victim is, is helpless. At that point, you're so manipulated and so uh, suppressed that you don't have that the courage to just walk away, and it does take time. So happy to report that that's already part of, um, um, it's in the books, and it will become effective this January. Um, and lastly, I wanna talk about um, SB 1190, uh, which allows a victim to terminate their lease early. I know that uh, it, it goes with course of control. I've heard stories of victims. When I set out to interview victims, I've heard so many different stories. One in particular, um, the perpetrator set out to ruin this person's credit, used every single credit card possible. And again, people don't understand how is this course of control or domestic violence. Uh, it's not that the perpetrator needed the money, but the intent is to run the victim's credit. What happens if the victim doesn't have the ability to flee and go get an apartment on their own or go get some, you know, a loan, anything that they might need? So this is a way how an abuser keeps their victim trapped by ruining their credit and the victim now is having a stay because they don't have any other choice. So SB 1190 that I helped co-author will now allow victims to walk away from their lease and not ruin their credit. Um, so uh, I want to just once again thank everyone here um, for joining me. There's so many other bills, and I hope that you do go to my website and uh, and take a look. If you have any ideas as well, I'm always happy to sit down and speak to you. But this is something that I hope that we will continue to discuss. It's something that I know um, it's not in the forefront. It seems like COVID-19 has taken over the discussion. And I hope that all of us here collectively continue to push this discussion because we need to keep our electeds, you know, engaged, educate them, including myself. I know what my experience was, but I've learned so much from so many other survivors. And I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Rubio, and thank you again for your amazing legislative work and for being at the forefront, really, of um, so many incredible changes. Hopefully, we'll um, lead the rest of the country. Um, so in line with our discussion of transformative work, I would now like to introduce retired advocate and published author Elaine Whitefeather. She's going to share the results of her work and the, on the impact of domestic violence on the transgender and minority communities. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's my great honor to be here. Let me begin by first thanking you, Senator Rubio, and thanking you, Esme, and thanking you, Evan, for using your voice, your position, your influence to increase safety, to increase awareness and education, and to bring back, to break the silence, especially for so many women of color, Senator Ruby, I've said that to you so many times. You really do not know the impact of those of us, of women of color, who speak out and use our stories, that we give permission to all of our brown and black and red and LGBT sisters and brothers to speak out and reach out and seek help. It's important, I think, this month and every month, every single day, I am a survivor. I'm a child survivor of sexual assault. I'm a teen survivor of assault, sexual assault in a hate crime because I am a two-spirited queer elder of many colors. And I am an adult survivor of same-sex IPV. I've spent the past four decades in the field of domestic violence. And some of the first legislation I worked on was 273.5. And so it was my great honor to end my career last year working with you, Senator, on 273. It seems sort of divine. 
Our work together, my work will forever be about addressing this issue. And I am so thrilled, Laura, for your presentation. It was thorough, complete, and I don't have to repeat it. So yay, I am so thrilled that it is now systemic and it is institutionalized. Because if you can recall, think back to California when I began in 1981, there were four shelters in our state. And so we are a state that is uh, resource rich. However, because we are also a state of great diversity, we have additional challenges for our communities of color. You'd think that if you are in a relationship that has coercive control, and I can tell you in same-sex IPV, that coercive control is often felt in the workplace. So where have we, because that's where we see each other, is in the workplace. So workplace coercive control now in same-sex IPV is where the workplace is used. Co-workers are used and the work itself is weaponized against one person. And so oftentimes leads to a great deal of professional and economic and as you might imagine, financial uh, barriers. So you'd think that we would tell a friend, you'd think we'd call someone, you'd think we'd tell anyone as a person of color. And, and, and I guess we could do that under most circumstances, except that the first barrier, as everyone has spoken to, to calling anyone for help is the issue of the trauma itself. Is the whole idea of power and control and coercive control is nothing really to do with the physical part of it. The physical part of it, in my opinion, in my 40 years, seals the deals for all of us as victims and survivors. It's the thing that makes you know, and you only got to be hit one time. You'll be threatened a million times, but they only have to follow through once for you to know it can happen again and again and again. In communities of color, the issue of domestic violence is 30 to 50% higher in black and brown communities and 60% higher in our transgender communities. It is an issue that's also rooted in a societal issue. So part of what we have to understand in communities of color is this is in the context of societal oppression. And so think about this during COVID now. We already are isolated in our homes, right? And then we have this huge, a great big, huge national truth telling of racial injustice. Now, who are you going to call? You're, you're, you're trapped in your home with your abuser, who we know from the field, COVID was used as a weapon. COVID was used as a weapon, bringing in, going out, exposing uh, the, the abuser or the victim, go out and get groceries, don't take a mask, don't hand sanitize. All of those things actually were used and are still being used during this pandemic as other ways of controlling victims. So in black and brown and LGBT communities and native communities, we're already growing up generationally with a mistrust of dominant culture. We have to choose oftentimes the kinds of abuses that we have to let go of. So half the time we're gonna let shine, we're gonna shine on at least six out of 10 types of abuses. We gotta pick and choose because you see, to lose your abuser and then be left alone in this greater world of oppression is not much of a choice. And then in my particular case, even trying to go to court and use same-sex IPV was not an option for me. She's also oppressed. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I knew what her life was like already as a queer woman. I knew what my life would be like. And so you find yourself in these communities, in our communities, struggling between protecting the very person who is our perpetrator from a greater oppression and making that tough choice. So I want to share with you that the folks that have come through the doors of a community for peace or from my sister cells here local here in Sacramento, I can speak about, those cases have been far more severe than any other cases we've had before the pandemic. And we've had more women, um, I mean, coercive control, as you said, is built into the, the protocols for health and safety during COVID. Uh, and that, that, so there's already that, but the, 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 the escape for women is so minimal, the window is so small. 
So I say what Laura was talking about and the impact to the children having to stay home. Now we have battered women, abused women, trying to homeschool their children with the abuser right there in the home. And we still have systems mandating them to complete their DD education, complete their parenting in a time like this. So all of this being trauma informed when we speak about communities of color, we really do have to remember the greater oppression with which domestic violence takes place. And that when we find really trauma informed, really heart smart law enforcement that responds, you are doing something more than responding to a crime. You are actually building a bridge of safety for generations of us to trust law enforcement again. It's really, really important. So we already know what the barriers are without this. But right now, on the other side of this, there will be such a surge, such a surge of women trying to escape. So it's important for me to, to say every way we speak about this issue, every single day, in all the ways that we can. Um, someone said it needs to be a film as well as a forum. It needs to be a conference as well as this. Senator Rubio, thank you for your phenomenal piece in our international uh, domestic violence survivor conference we launched. Um, it was incredible, your involvement, and this is one of many. So we are doing that. I'm doing that now. I'm retired from the line, but I'm now heading up a foundation to bring this kind of education and information in the most creative ways I can to reach people everywhere. Our voices are so critical, and I want us to remember that to, to every survivor and to every frontline worker, um, a Community for Peace, for example, is one of those organizations that actually serves Black, Brown, Native, and LGBTQ. And that means their staff is credible messengers that share the same oppression out here in the community. We have to endure the same shootings, the same kinds of things that everyone else does, and take care of trauma victims at the same time. So I want to extend to all of those advocates too, our compassion and understanding, our blessings and well wishes, because they are frontline workers that no one thought about. And right now, we're, we kept our doors open and we kept our shelters open. And, um, you know, we've given birth to children in shelters during this period of time. And so what we're doing, every step you take, Senator, everyone who takes every single word, two years was a good two years, Senator, and we are going to keep pushing the envelope because we must. I am been here 40 years. I cannot tell you how I have chills up and down right now. I cannot tell you how happy I am that there's a whole nother generation of young women, women of all walks of life, especially at the, that represent the diversity of who we are in America. Um, this is our time now. It's more than just the, the issue. This is gender-based violence across the world that was created 2000 years ago in a, in a law of chastisement that said women and children were property to be controlled. We are at the end of that paradigm and women are the ones making the change. And we're not making the change out of anger. We're making the change out of necessity, purpose, and intention. Why? Because our children, our children deserve a world where peace is normal, not abuse. So I think that's about the end of my time. I'm thanking you all so much, really, truly. You are that other generation. I'm almost 70 years old. So I've been at this a long time and I, my heart is so big and full to know that we are going to keep this work going for the next generation. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to every advocate, to every survivor. Remember this, our abuse and trauma revealed who we were and that's why change has happened. You are not your trauma. We are far more than anything that's ever happened to us and you are living proof. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, you are so inspiring. Um, <laughs> you cry. Yeah, reduce the heaven to tears. <laughs> um, every time I hear you speak, you have such an incredible perspective and you share a perspective that is very different from my own and I really appreciate that. So thank you so much for those um, amazing words.
Um, okay, moving on, um, we have Cynthia Espinosa, who's a community service officer with the Baldwin Park Police Department. She's going to give us an in-depth look at local domestic violence statistics and resources amid the pandemic. Well, good morning, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm with the Baldwin Park Police Department. I've been here for 12 years and I'm their actual domestic violence advocate. Um, I grew up here in the city um, since uh, 1983. And just like you guys, I'm also a survivor of domestic violence. So um, I wanted to just kind of share a little bit because since I'm with the law enforcement, I really take these uh, cases really serious. I am gonna share a little bit of a, can you guys, is it on correct? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and if, I'm gonna talk about what the department does when we get a victim of domestic violence. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint really quick. I get the right one here. Okay, so, all right, what are we doing to help? And this is exactly what we do um, when we have a victim. So we contact each victim. So the detectives give me a case and I contact the victims here. We explore safety options for them. We talk about personal support and counseling. Um, I assist them with restraining orders if needed. I also assist the district attorney if they need uh, relocation, if uh, that's something that they need to do. The resource options that we have and that we talk about are our helplines, shelters, legal help, suggest monitor visitations, because a lot of times they're afraid of, um, you know, the the having their kids going with the parent and, and, and all that. So we make sure that we talk about that. We talk about the personal safety planning in order to, they're not gonna leave right away. So we kind of talk about trying to get a plan in place we talk about self, uh, self-defense and I do um, go with the victims to court if needed. And then we also do what's called the, uh, we assist with immigration relief, which is called a U visa. And that's something that it's a little bit on a different subject, but it's something that we do within my program. And then um, we also refer them to other services organizations out there. And then that would be on my next um, slide. And then I work hand in hand with other detectives to provide them um, with an ongoing domestic violence investigation. So what we came to realize, like you guys, most of you guys said that when uh, there's a, a report taken by our law enforcement, a lot of times victims are afraid of what law enforcement is going to say. They're not going to take them serious. So that's where I come in because since I understand where, they, where they're at, um, I never ask why you still there. I never tell them why you coming again. I never do that. So that makes them feel really comfortable to come to me instead of the detective. I'm the one that actually re uh, reaches out to the victims to make sure that their investigation or the cases gets closed correctly. And these are the other referrals that we have that I talked to them about, which is um, the Neighborhood Legal Services. We talk about Victims Compensation um, Government Claim Board Program. The, we, I refer them to WINKS. We also talk about the victim information and notification every day, which is called a VINE which they actually can send out a text to them and they'll um, get a text uh, when the suspect is released from jail. And then I also refer them to the victim's advocate at the court system, just in case there's something that I cannot do from here, from the department, then they can go, um, go ahead and talk to the um, victim's advocate in the court system. And then I go ahead and we talk about different shelters. As you all know, a lot of times when we're a, a victim of domestic violence, it's really hard to make the decision of going to a shelter because of the 72 hour sometimes uh, isolation and all that. So I we have an actual partnership with one of our local hotels here that if this victim only needs a couple of hours just to stay out of the house until they decide what they're gonna do, I go ahead and reach out to them and we'll put them in that particular hotel for whatever time they need. And the current process of communication through my for my victims that I'm doing right now is either phone call, email, person to person. And another thing that um, I know that you, for the most part, you guys were also mentioning about the domestic violence starts at a very young age. I know that um, I was a, a victim at a very young age. So what I have done is I actually go to the high schools to do presentations on teen dating. This way they know what to, um, to look out for 
we talk about the jealous scene, we talk about the lipsticks, we talk about the hairdos, we talk about the clothes, we talk about the friends and you know only having a particular um, friends and all that. So I go out to our community and like I said, I grew up here in the city. So I take this very, very serious where I wanna make sure that they understand that domestic violence is not something of an older age. It actually starts at a very age. And I actually have seen a couple from like 13 years old and that's probably the youngest that I've actually talked to, 13 years old. And um, I know that you guys, we wanted to talk a little bit of stats and what is happening right now. So um, I kind of put this together. And remember, this is just for Vaughn Park. This is something that I that we have here in our city. And I just compared 2019, 2020. So this is year to date. So in 2019, we had a case, we had a, um, 125 cases, which of those 37 cases were misdemeanors and 16 were actually arrest. Six were rejected by the DA and 15 no arrest under investigation. And that could, be, that could be for many reasons. And then we also had 88 felony cases, which are more severe, more of the strangulation, the punching, the kicking, the biting and all that. So we had 55 arrest, five rejected, and 28 of them, again, they're uh, under investigation. And right now with the pandemic going on in 2020, we already have 100 cases and we're just in the middle of October, we have 23 cases, misdemeanors, six have been arrested, two have been rejected, 15 are still under investigation, but we have 77 cases already in felonies. We had 28 arrests, 11 rejected, and 35 are still ongoing investigation, okay? So this is what's going on here in our city. So this is what we're trying to um, make sure that the, our, our community actually realizes that you know, that I'm here. I know that a lot of times it gets difficult to reach out to somebody, but I'm out there in the community. People know that we have this program and we try to make it, you know, sure that they are aware of what we actually do. We've had a very good success with the program and we, you know, we hope to continue doing our work, um, not just myself, but the police officers and obviously our detective um, unit, make sure that they're constantly getting more training on different stuff that's changing for all these arrests to happen. So with this said, I know that we were also talking about how it affects different, um, the kids at home and all that. So with the domestic violence program, I'm also helping additional cases or different victims, which is these child abuse cases, rape cases and family disturbance. And right now, again, with the pandemic and everything, everything is obviously going a little bit more, everybody's more tense, there's more, um, Patience is not there. The aggression's a little bit more. So I'm here for um, in case of any requests by officers or detectives or any you know anybody out there in the community, I go ahead and uh, take these kind of, of cases too. And um, uh, one thing that I like to explain to my victims and to anybody that's asking, what is the Vaughn Park Police Department? What do you guys do and how is the process? What is it that you guys do? So I pretty much put this little graph together. Um, so it's understanding of how the process is. So this is, you know, the the first part, which is call 911, and this is how the graphic goes. If there's a suspect present, the arrest is made. If not, what happens? And what is it that the actual police officer does right there and then? Then this is the second part, which is the detective process. Which if there's an arrest. You know, we don't do further interview because it's already there. If they didn't need to do it, you know, if there's no arrest, the detective tends to contact, locate suspect. And uh, we, we explain this because people need to understand that it's a process that we need to make sure that we follow. If it's going to be rejected, a misdemeanor, felony, and then um, after that, the file is going to be obviously filed with the court clerk and then they'll take it from there. And then this is my part, which is uh, very important. I do contact the victims. It doesn't matter if there is an arrest or no arrest. I talk to them about the restraining order. If there was a restraining order, I make sure that they have their court case. We talk again about safety, um, planning for them, resources, and we talk about the counseling, the shelters, and or I simply just listen. A lot of the victims actually wanna come, continue coming back to me. And a lot of times they just wanna have like a safe place to come. And the fact that they understand that I understand them, that I'm not judging them, that they can feel comfortable 
that they could uh, tell me and I'm not going to ask, well, why are you still there? Why haven't you left? This is something that it's very important for victims to understand that you could always come here. You could always contact an advocate because this is our job. This is what we want to do. We want to help you out because again, most of us have been there and we want to make sure that you guys understand that there's still hope, that you don't have to stay there, that there's different um, programs out there that people care. Um, this is something that, um, you know, like the panel said, we cannot be embarrassed of something that we really at some point didn't have uh, control of because we didn't understand at first, what, what, why was it happening to us? So why did it happen to us? So um, again, um, sometimes it's just to simply listen and that makes a difference for a victim. It really does. I, I know it has because I see a lot of victims that have came here uh, throughout my community and they have told me, um, you know what? It was just a matter of knowing that somebody's there that cares. I stopped or even the children tell me, mommy's no longer there or daddy left. And that to me says a lot. So, and, and I know that this program is making that change. So that was my presentation for, for that, for as far as what we're doing. Um, and again, like I said, you know, I myself take this very serious. Um, I don't, I never um, turn a victim down. I always listen to them. I also make sure that not only am I doing my part, but that our detectives and our police officers take this serious. Um, they know it's not a secret. They know that I'm actually a survivor of uh, domestic violence and they know how serious I take it. And the fact that they understand that is also makes it a lot easier for them to come to me and for me to go actually reach out to the victims. So um, that's, you know, my, my part of it. And uh, one of the things that I do want you all to know is that I admire every single one of you. I think it's amazing that there's so many, you know, women out there and men as well that, um, you know, we don't let this actually ruin us. It actually gives us that empowerment to actually want to reach out to other victims and under and make them understand that, you know what, it happened, but you know what, let's let's talk about it. Let's teach people that it's okay, that we can make a difference. And um, I know I have, and this is the last, you know, one of the, the last points that I'm going to do. I have um, two boys, actually at a very young age, I had my first one at 16. And I was determined that I wanted to make sure that my boys, now men, they're 30 and 27, did not do this to to somebody else out there. So my part was to cut that circle with my boys and um, to teach them that they needed to respect women. And guess what? I did that. Um, you know, they, they respected me even more. And sometimes those are the little steps that we have to do. We have to make the difference within our own circle. And... Um, I know that whoever my, my boys date, they're not going to be threatened. They're not going to be, you know, in, in an abusive relationship. And to me, that's my part there. So that's what I want to do to to others, you know, cut that circle and change it. You know, let's make a change. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, officer. Um, that was really, it was really great to see that process of um, how the investigation takes place and um, how an arrest is made. And I think that helps to demystify it a little bit. It makes it a little less scary for survivors who are coming forward. So thank you for that. Um, okay, now we have some questions um, which have been sent in from um, the community. Um, so I think we're going to um, hand each question off to a panelist to answer. So I think the first question is for um, you, Senator Rubio. Um, what are some of the tips and advice that you can give to victims who are experiencing domestic violence? And what are some helpful tips for families of domestic violence victims? Well, thank you. Um, but, but before I answer this, I wanna thank uh, Cynthia Espinoza. Um, I happen to know her personally because, you know, I served as the council member for the city where she currently is employed, City of Baldwin Park. And probably for the first time ever publicly, I will admit and share that um, my very own police department came to my house in one of the incidents that occurred. And I could not tell the truth. It was one of those moments where my police officers were saying, Ms. Rubio, please 
tell us what happened. And it just goes to speak to the shame and embarrassment that I felt at the time that I couldn't. I could not tell the truth. And so Cynthia has been such a good advocate for domestic violence survivors and victims. Um, she's been with us for a long time uh, in the city and she has proof to be such an asset to that community because we know that there's so many victims that come through her office. So thank you to Cynthia and the Baldwin Park Police Department for always being there for victims. Um, going back to the question, um, what tips can we offer? Uh, we know that the pandemic right now has made it very difficult for victims uh, in particular because this situation makes it the ideal situation for, for uh, abusers because naturally the victims are isolated. So I wanna offer a, a really quick tips. Uh, number one, make sure that you connect with either a trusted friend or family member and make sure that they check in on you every single day just to ask how you're doing. But at the same time, develop a secret signal, whether it be a keyword or maybe a color that you're wearing to signal that your life is in danger so they can call 911 for you. Uh, number two, um, I, I want everyone to think about this. This is not something you think about naturally, but I would encourage everyone to scan the room. If you're a victim currently experiencing domestic violence, please scan the room for any potential weapons. In a moment of, uh, of violence, in a moment, uh, in the heat of the moment, the abuser has easy access to a knife or a bat. Make sure that you scan your room and put everything that's dangerous dangerous away, whether it be knives, put them in, in a door. If it's a bat, put it in the closet. Make sure that they don't have something easy that they can grab and assault you and possi possibly kill you. Uh, number three, make sure that you have a safety plan in place. And that is so simple as memorizing the domestic violence hotline. Again, when you're in trauma or experiencing an assault, you don't know where that number is and, and to find it's even more difficult. So please memorize it. Be able to dial it right away if you need help. And if your life is in danger, call 911. Don't hesitate to call 911. Thank you. Could I add something to that, please? If that, if I could, please. Yes, I'd like to yes. ask a, a moment of safety planning, adding to that, Susan, about safety planning with you if you have children. So make sure that the safety plan includes the children, that they have, they know who safe people are. And if it's the neighbor next door, they have a safe place to go. Every child needs to have a job, starting with the oldest one, get the next one, get the next one, and the dog, and go someplace and have a code word. So in my family, it was Pegasus. I let the children pick the, the code word. So Pegasus became the word everybody meant scrambled. So remember, as survivors, we got a lot we're trying to manage. Those tips are important. You will also relieve the stress of yourself if you can help your children be involved in the safety plan. Don't worry, they already know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. This, this next question is actually for you and um, how we can support victims of domestic violence. And is this, is this different from how we can support the LGBTQ community experiencing domestic violence? First thing for all victims is believe them. I don't care who they are, believe them. This is not something that's easy for any of us to say. And whatever it is that we're going to tell you, we're gonna tell you the safest part of the story. We're not even gonna tell you the stuff that really happens. So understand that everything that we tell you, if I tell you I was raped, I'm gonna tell you the safest part of that story. I'm not telling you the big deal. So understand that, that's number one. Um, believe them, just believe them, believe them and believe them some more. Number two, um, really get un, be educated about the issue. The question of why did she stay is the question that, excuse my language, will piss us off the most, okay? But the question we might wanna ask, start asking is, why does someone who say they love you hurt you that way? And when you turn that question around the other way, the victim understands, wait, love and abuse, they don't go together. So it's those questions, so believe them. Um, never ask that question. The other thing is that always ask, are you safe now? 
right now in this now moment, because we understand the cycle pattern. We might not know what it's called, but we know it's a pattern. And so if I just experienced an acute incident, I'm going to be safe right then if there is a honeymoon present in my cycle. So that's not necessarily an indication I'm safe. So the question of are you safe now lets the rest of us know this is an immediate moment. And so when Cynthia was saying, I think, you know, Laura, we talked about code words. Our, we've launched an international movement called hashtag my name is Harriet. And it's really formed over uh, Harriet Tubman as an escape for women. There are signals that are created by survivors right now in 2020 because of COVID that's helping us all signal. So one of them is this means I'm trapped. If I am doing a YouTube with my friends, it looks like this, means I'm trapped. You could be talking about a recipe, right? One of the other things we're also trying to do is get in all countries, you know, what is the one corporate thing we can do? Well, I guess we got McDonald's and we got Starbucks. So could, could a woman just walk into anywhere, any place and just say, my name is Harriet, and it means there's, I need to get out now. I need to escape now. So we don't get to the point of saying, I need to get out as a casual thing to say. If we get to that point, we need to get out now and we need to know that. So I'm asking all of us who are friends and allies, you get knowledgeable about those resources. You find out what's local, get those numbers because they, we are in trauma. We might not remember that number, but you will. And don't forget about the children and don't forget about the animals. How the children and the animals are treated tells you the level of domestic violence in that home. So I'm going to just start with this. In our community, in the LGBT community, number one, we don't even talk about it. So the fact that we even can, anyone can acknowledge that it happens to be able to believe them and always say, you didn't deserve this to happen. No one ever deserves to be abused. I don't care what you did. No one ever deserves to be abused. So believe them, take care of the children, the pets, and please affirm that allies and friends and advocates, you learn your local resources and have it stand by. Thank you so much, Elaine. I love the, um, my name is Harriet, I think that's, mm -hmm. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn that hand signal. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully never gonna need it again. Yeah. Um, so the next question um, was for us. So I'm gonna ask you, Evan. So um, question is, how do we bring more awareness to domestic violence and how do we bring that to a larger audience? Um, well, I think what we've been doing is trying to educate people as much as possible and to use our platforms, not just to elevate our voices and our stories, but the stories of other survivors and people from all walks of life and bringing in uh, every aspect of domestic violence. Um, I've learned through this process that it's something that affects um, people differently depending on um, how old you are, where you come from, um, you know, your sexual orientation, the community that you live in, you know, everybody's dealing with sort of a different set of, of, of issues and problems and we have to learn how to make this work for everyone. Um, and, um, so elevating other people's voices, education, um, I, you know, you were talking about representation, you know, certainly representation on, on screen. I mean, we take so much of our cues from what we see in films and, and, um, I haven't seen great representations of domestic mm -hmm. violence. I think it's a really, um, watered down version and, um, so I think um, really uh, opening the door for people to see the dark corners of this issue is, is incredibly important. Um, I will continue to tell my story. Um, I'm going to continue my education. Um, and I also have a son and I'm going to continue to educate him um, and, and, and hopefully um, raise somebody that that will have this in, in their mind going forward and that will usher in mm -hmm. change. Um, we've also started a, a hashtag and hoping that it could also be used as somewhat of a code word. Um, it, uh, our hashtag is I am not okay. And we want that to sort of be the way that you tell somebody that you are 
are not safe. If somebody says, are you okay? You could just, we want people just to be able to look at somebody and say, I am not okay. And that means I need to get out, please help me. <laughs> um, but it also became a hashtag where uh, survivors, much like uh, um, you know the, the, the Me Too hashtag, uh, it, just a, a, a safe place for survivors to be able to share their stories. Because I do think um, one of the first steps of empowerment is, is somebody that believes you and understands you mm -hmm. and sees you. And, um, you know, that's a great place for somebody to go if they're maybe still too scared to tell law enforcement or family or friends or want to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. You can go there. You can start to sort of find a community and find resources. Um, uh, we're going to continue to push for uh, more legislation, um, uh, uh, passing the Phoenix Act and other states that might need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of the um, lobbying process or... Yeah, well, I think um, I, I just brought up and further to um, what um, Officer Cynthia Espinosa was saying um, about education and talking about um, domestic violence to in schools. I think that that is so, so important because um, at the moment, I don't think that there's a broad understanding of what domestic violence really is. Um, you know, it's so fantastic that this coercive control legislation has just passed because I think for the majority of victims, that is the hardest part to reconcile. And it's the um, least visible, it's the least visible um, aspect of domestic violence. So I think um, having that education um, in schools so that when um, children are having their first relationships, even friendships, but their first experience of dating, that they know what is normal, what is acceptable, what is okay. Like, and I think, you know, I, for myself, I, some of my early experiences weren't okay. So I didn't have a framework um, to really understand what was healthy and what wasn't. So I think those conversations really need to start happening um, in our schools, in our homes, um, you know, on social media. Um, and, and I think the more, um, victims, survivors can come forward with their stories and we can see the breadth of the types of people who are affected by this, then hopefully in like the LGBTQ community, it can start being explored. People can start talking about it. The stigma um, starts to dissolve. So I think, um, you know, the more um, people can advocate and talk about their experiences, um, the better. Mm -hmm. That actually is a great way to segue into our next question is for Laura. Um, yes, um, so Laura, um, can you tell us what's, um, what are some of the most common telltale signs of an unhealthy relationship? Yes, and you know, unhealthy versus healthy is so important. That's why Dirty John was such an important story to tell. You know, what's dressed up as caring and attentive behavior can sometimes be controlling behavior. So the smoothie making, the running of the shower, the rubbing of Deborah's feet, all these things making himself too good to be true. Well, yes, he was too good to be true. So the, the challenge for all of us is that girls and women are groomed for a, from a very young age. And the grooming means that we look to ourselves first of all when there's a problem in a relationship. And everyone expects us to uh, be the ones responsible for boys and men's happiness and we are not so I think that early education is so important the whirlwind relationship you know grand declarations of love on date number two that's a whirlwind and someone's trying to move the relationship forward you cannot be intimate and have intimacy with someone and say that you love them when you've only seen them two or three times that's a big red flag um, when we understand that control and jealousy is not love, and so the bombardment, the love bombing, the impression management, these are all things that when I work with young girls, I also explain that this is not love. It's dressed up as that, and it can be flattering. It can make you feel special, and we all want to feel special. We all want to connect. So we have to unravel some of these things that we're osmosing, all these messages in the media, in music, in movies, of, of what it means that nine no's takes you to a yes in the movies and the guy always gets the girl. Well, we need to transition that. And what it also looks and might feel like is for you, if you are, if there is abuse present, you may be being made to feel bad and you may lose your sparkle. 
you may feel that there's an imbalance, that you're constantly meeting someone else's needs and you're walking on eggshells to meet those needs. That's when I hear that there's abuse going on. If there's um, somebody constantly making you jump through hoops to meet their needs, I always ask people, well, where are your needs? Do you know what they are? What's the person doing to meet what you need in life? And if there are rules and regulations laid down, well, they come in very subtly and sometimes they're dressed up to be the, you know, you're, they're trying to help someone be the best version of themselves. Well, I'm only doing it to help you. If you did it this way or that way, you know, that's actually gaslighting when you're constantly reality distorting to create power over someone. And that's really when we start to see the entrapment begin. It's like taking over the mind of changing what she is, who and what she is over time. So when you feel like you have no autonomy, no agency, when you feel like your self-confidence drip, drip, drip is being eroded, and this is grooming, and it goes on across time. So there are lots of behaviors that I try and characterize in the podcast, certainly with Dirty John in the Bravo show with actor Connie Britton, who spent a lot of time trying to understand coercive control. But those who want to hear more can certainly listen to Real Crime Profile. Uh, we're currently looking at the American murder, the family next door, which is the Shannon Watts. Bella Watts, Cece Watts, and Nico Watts, the, the brutal murders that people think came out of the blue, but they did not. And the problem is when the dominant narrative takes course that he was the best father and he was the best husband, that was not what I saw. And every review that I look at, I see very different messaging and codified behavior. And whoever desires intimacy the least controls the relationship. So oftentimes it looks like the girl or woman controls the emotional temperature, but more often than not, it's the abuser who does. So a lot of the work that I think we have to do is demystifying, decodifying, having very clear conversations about what healthy looks like and what it looks like is respect, trust, boundaries, elevating each other to be the best that you can. And so I'd always ask people to look at their relationships because 51% of victims don't know they're being victimized. And that's why I challenge the government in England and Wales to create the offense of coercive control. It is a criminal behavior in England and Wales from 2015. We have many more people coming forward now to share their experiences. And that's how you create change, voices, the right messaging, and putting victims' voices at the center of things, but we have to challenge the status quo of what's healthy, what's good. Um, so yes, it's a long answer, but there's a lot of work for us to do together. Thank you so much. Um, I think our next question is for Cynthia. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, Oh, our favorite question. <laughs> Why do victims sometimes return to or stay with their abusers? Well, there's a few and I'll give you a list. And um, this is the reason why I do not ask because I pretty much have them all in, in, and I know the reasons. First of all, the main one is for myself that I know for most of us is first of all, is shame, fear, nowhere to go, finances, a house maybe, the kids, no family in the area, and um, they think they're in love, and they think that the person's going to change, and they think that it's just going to be one time, and or um, I know that I hear it a lot is that they're getting threatened by the kids are going to be taken away from you if you leave the house with the kids, if you, you know, all that. So those are the reasons. I'm sure there's more out there for others, but these are the main ones that I'm, um, that I can relate to. Um, but like I said, and I think most of us here, um, the main one that I, I think it's, it's shame and fear. And, um, you know, and those are the two that are the strongest. And once you kind of make them understand that, don't be, you're not the only one, we're going to help you. There's no shame. Don't be, you know, don't be afraid. We're going to help you. Then everything else starts coming out and we're, and, and it makes it easier for us to go ahead and help them. So those, you know, and of course, right. We've all thought that we've been in love and, um, you know, and we confuse it. So, um, and, but those are my lists that I know for sure that some of those might be the main ones. And like I said, there might be a lot more. 
Can I just add something into the mix? Of course. Thank you, which is just that at times our systems force us back. The criminal justice system forces us back. Professionals within it force us back. The family justice system forces us back. You know, I've had clients who have managed to, we've managed to free them and then the family justice system brings them back. So we have to look at our systems as well and the messaging to victims, you know, even that, why did you stay rather than why does he do what he do does. We're looking at the wrong end of the problem consistently and continuously. Yeah, you're absolutely right because I do get cases when, um, you know, the there's been an arrest and I hear that this person's out of jail and I'm thinking, why? Wait, what happened? What's going on? And so, yes, I completely agree with you. There has to be a change in our, in, you know, in the system as far as, as that too. And that's why, as for me internally here, when they do come and ask for help, first step, I make sure that we do help them out. But as far as when they get released and all that, it does surprise me sometimes too. Can I add something to that too, just briefly? Our court systems also in California with shared custody force our, our, our moms to continue that relationship with a batterer till that child is 18 years old. And so there's another place in our courts, especially with our CPS and our, 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 our children's courts, we need to have a lot more advocacy in there, a lot more trauma-informed understanding among our CPS social workers and also family court and children's court because we are forcing women to have to share custody with really very serious abusers. So that's another place we really have to go. Yeah, I had one thing to add to that as well. And, and I tell people this to shift their perspective sometimes if they're judging a, a victim for staying, um, I say, try not to judge them. They may not be a weak person staying. They may be a very brave person strategizing. So give them time and space. Yeah, and <laughs> but I also want to add uh, to the list that Cynthia and all of you guys just expressed, which I think it's really important, especially for a community like the one that I represent, where Cynthia is now a police officer, which is Baldwin Park. We have a high a number of immigrant families. And what happens, one of the biggest threats in our community, immigrant communities, is that, uh, you know, individuals without documentation are the ones that are constant being threatened. So for anyone listening, listening out there, protections also include you. You do not have to put up with it just because you're undocumented. There is help. And I know that we talked about Baldwin Park, but uh, wherever you're at, any city that you're in, please check with your local police department, get information, look for uh, resources that they provide. And again, you don't have to be afraid. It includes protections, includes everyone, including if you're undocumented. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much for adding that, um, Senator. Um, so I think we're about um, we're about to wrap up. Um, I want to thank all the panelists who've taken place in this conversation um, for your amazing honesty and openness and um, candor. Um, I've learned a lot myself, um, and I just think these are really important conversations to keep having. So I thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand over to Senator Rubio now for her closing remarks. And thank you again. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all here today and everyone listening at home. Uh, it is such a timely and important conversation to have. I personally have learned uh, quite a bit myself and we don't stop learning, but um, I wanted to share one more bill that I think it's relevant to, to share, which is SB 12. 76, which removes the matching fund requirement, uh, and that was chaptered immediately. Uh, and that is uh, right now during the pandemic, a lot of organizations are having a really difficult time fundraising. And so it's very difficult to expect them to put in matching funds in order to get uh, uh, state resources or federal resources. So this bill removed that matching fund to be able to have more resources for, for victims and anyone that needs it. But um, ladies, uh, thank you so much for being here, Elaine, Lara, Esme, Evan, and Cynthia. I wish we could do this in person, but, you know, of course, we have to uh, stay safe during this time. But I did send each and every one of you a certificate, and I hope that you have it with you. And I just want to take a time to read it. And, um, uh, again, Californians, thanks you. I know, Esme and Evan, you've been trying to push legislation across our, uh, our, our nation and 
Lara, of course, globally, this is a serious issue that everyone needs to pay attention to. And I wanna take a moment to thank hundreds and hundreds of victims from all over the world that have actually emailed me and thanked me for some of the legislation that I've been passing here in California because they feel that it's one step forward. Now other states and other countries, as far as Australia, Ireland, can follow. So thank you so much for all your messages. I, I read them all the time. I, I hear you and I want to just say that I'm here to support any other efforts outside of California as well. So thank you. So on behalf of the California State Senate, it is my pleasure to present all the panelists with this certificate. I commend you for your work and dedication towards the fight against domestic violence. Your commitment to bringing awareness and resources to our communities is vital to diminish the stigma against breaking the silence. I thank you for your invaluable words and for the inspiration and hope that you provide to survivors of domestic abuse. And you inspire me as well. So thank you. And I hope that we can all raise our certificate so we can take a group picture if we all have it. Thank you. Our staff just took a picture. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to say that together, we can break the silence. And I hope that all of us here today have encouraged some of you that are still behind closed doors, fearing to coming out, please say something. We're here for you. We see you, we hear you. And all of us here believes you. So thank you. And with that, I'm gonna wish you a good day and thank you everyone. And please stay safe.